Um, so what was it like to be able to work on an 80-year-old tank? Uh, I don't really see it as 80 years old, I suppose. I see it predominantly as, as British, you know, and an important piece of our history. She shows her age at times, <laughs> definitely. But uh, no, she's, she's not 80, she's, she's an old girl. I served for 27 years in the British Army as a tank crewman and worked on Chieftains, Challenger 1 and Challenger 2. Tank restoration, general engineering, electrical engineering and tank restoration. Uh, a, a bit. I worked with my car and my dad and things like that, but nothing you know, to the scale with, with tanks and military vehicles and stuff. I, I wanted to know how it works. And, well, it was really, I suppose, it was Tom, come and help me with this. <laughs> we had a look in it and then it became a, oh. We sort of estimated it might take two years, uh, probably about three and a bit, but came in for a gearbox look at because it stopped working, but very quickly became obvious due to the poor mechanical state of the vehicle, you either stopped running it or you did a full overhaul on it. There was other systems that were either broken or very near to being bro broken, so there was a little bit of what we would call mission creep in the sense that, you know, everything, we took, oh, this is gone, this is gone, and then at some stage during that whole decision-making progress, they just said, well, we might as well uh, carry on and do a full restoration. Which part are you most proud of? Um, the standard of work um, and the lengths that the team went to to achieve that. Um, uh, you know, it's, there was an awful lot going on at one time. It, although it was a small team, it, it worked exceptionally well together and everybody um, gave us their best day. And um, what was the high point? Tiger Day 2018, uh, when she went out for her first run. Uh, we gnawed out the teething problems that we had had previously. Uh, she'd been tested in the yard and in the arena, so we were confident that the vehicle was going to run. Um, it was just the fact that you're seeing the reaction of the crowd um, and the reaction of the team who all turned up, um, you know, on, on their day off to, to see her go. Um, well, yeah, there's a sense of pride, isn't it, that you've gone from something that was a complete state to bringing it back to how it should be. Um, to see it running around the arena was, was really good. Um, I suppose from perspective of somebody who's worked on it, just to hear it and see it going, like when the engines were taking over, it just sounded so good. You know, quite a lot of people are just seeing a tank going around. Whereas actually when we're seeing everything working the way it should be, that's the best bit, I think, really. When it drove back out under its power and it steered and worked properly. Uh, pride's quite the right word. Um, very satisfied with it. We could do things better next time. Some of it wasn't quite as we wanted it due to various considerations. How did you feel about getting that standing ovation at Tiger? Um, if I was very honest, um, at, the, at that point in the proceedings, I was um, keeping an eye on oil pressures, um, air pressures, um, engine temperatures, listening out on the radio, and the noise of the engines as well. Um, you know, I was very much focused on David because I needed to see his cue for when I moved off again. Uh, I didn't really at the time, but it was pointed out to me afterwards. Um, just concentrating on making sure you're running right, etc. It's good to know that somebody appreciates it. The low point was definitely not being ready for Tank Fest 2018. As you've seen throughout the Matilda diaries, at every stage when we've um, done work on a major assembly, we've tested it before putting it into the vehicle. And although it performed initially very well, unfortunately it developed an internal fault, which the only way we can fix is to lift the gearbox. And there simply isn't time to do that before Tank Fest. Uh, there was an enormous amount of work that had gone into the preparation. We were very close to it being there. In retrospect, the decision was an easy one because if we had have run it, we'd have risked systems that were working perfectly. But it didn't detract from the disappointment that the whole team felt that she wasn't there on the day. Uh, yeah, I suppose um, there was one instance where you know, trying to get the starter motors off and, and removing the, uh, the cables from them, I spent most of the day upside down in <coughs> underneath the engines, 
through where the oil tanks go. We pulled them out with their cable in and found that um, it was all wrapped up in tape. Once we undid that, we found that fitters had chopped them so they could be put in easier and removed easier. Just removed this tape, we'd have seen that we could have unbolted the thing and whipped it out. But yes, that was, uh, uh, I was bruised after that and I didn't need to be. What was the hardest part of the whole project? Uh, from my point of view, with the gearbox rebuild, uh, because we had to have all the bushes made, which uh, cracking volunteer engineer Bob Kendall did, and then I had to scrape them all in, so it took a long time to put it back together. It's very, very fiddly. And then, of course, it didn't work properly at the first time, which we didn't really expect. And then we had to rebuild it again, which, fortunately, second time through, it was OK. Um, tell me about Matt McMahon. What did he do? Uh, Matt McMahon is um, a collector of armoured vehicles and a farmer who lives in Australia. Um, he's amassed quite a, a few interesting vehicles, uh, including a Matilda II uh, that he runs um, at weekends for his friends and such uh, around his farm uh, down in New South Wales. His dad bought one of the ex-Australian Army ones back in the 50s. He got very interested in the tank himself and over the years he's acquired a lot of spare parts. Um, very generously he donated them to the project which speeded the whole job up quite a bit. We could have still probably carried it out, but it would have been more expensive and time consuming. Um, he was a source of advice. Um, I went out there and stayed with his family. Uh, you know, he's a great guy. Um, he's, he, he provided the bits that we couldn't get out of the manuals, uh, that only someone that could run an armoured vehicle, a particular armoured vehicle, would know. He was really, really was a key a member of the project, uh, even if it was from such a distance. How important was the Tank Museum archive in the project? The archive um, at the Tank Museum is a world-class facility. Um, Stuart, who runs it, um, got every piece of information that he could find. They also have the vehicle specification book, so things like um, finding paint specifications and material specs for the various components we had to make was all there. We didn't have to research it like sending something off to a lab to have it analysed or anything like that. Uh, actually removing the barrel and the mantlet, which was something that we were only guessing how we would do, we managed to find the actual section in the book that says you need this amount of wood and this amount of rope and this is how you do it, and which is a great historical experiment in itself because we read the manual and we say, really? Um, and then we, we get those bits and bobs together and do it. Again, Matt comes into this because <coughs> the Australian Army were the last ones to use the Matilda and the Australian Remy actually produced their own information for their chaps to use. And some of it's actually better than the original stuff because it's more practical. Only through doing it, only through actually picking up the spanner, undoing that nut, can you have the whole picture. But without the manuals, uh, you know, you really are, you know, experimenting. On to a potentially other controversial subject. Can you tell me about the paint scheme? The paint scheme, <coughs> I don't think it's controversial, but obviously various people want to see it back in the corner scheme. When we started to take the vehicle apart, it became obvious that the desert type scheme that was on it, the corner scheme, and an earlier one which is plain sand, um, somebody just fitted them at the museum back in the midst of time. The original paint scheme was the khaki green. All the components they couldn't get at easily, such as the suspension, etc., were still in their original paint. When we had the paint analysed, um, it came back as khaki number three. Uh, we found a company that made khaki number three to the same shade as that came out of the Vulcan foundry. And then you've got to account for um, so many years of ageing. Um, but we know that the external um, paint on that tank is exactly the same as what it came out of the Vulcan foundry. I think we're probably more right with it now than we would be in its desert scheme, um, to be honest. What would you do differently next time? Um, some of the things that we have to address from this project have, have already been taken care of with the arrival of the new workshop. Um, now we can do lifts no matter what the weather is. Uh, we have a dedicated engine uh, clean room which we could have done both of the engines at once uh, rather than doing them one at a time with the facilities that we made here. Um, we're hopeful that in the future that we'll have our own dedicated spraying facility and, and hopefully shorten the length of the project. What lessons would you take from this project? If you're going to do a project of this magnitude, it's very important right at the start to get all of the stakeholders sat down and agree at that point what the parameters are. Any technical processes you've got to go through, 
you can get get those on board first find specialist suppliers etc get advice and help from somebody who may have done it before i.e matt in australia um so unfortunately some of the things we did with the gearbox um we could have got over those problems easier if we'd known about that earlier we had to make a lot of decisions on the hoof um and i think it's certainly for the next one that i do i'll be very keen to get people around the table and agree on how we're going to do it before we actually commit i mean you've obviously spent a lot of time really getting to grips with the very very tiny details of this tank what would you say to the designers of the material too if you could meet them uh, they need to make it simpler <laughs> um, you can understand why it's complicated because it's almost a first try for the Vulcan foundry people. Um, but certain things which they actually did later on in later marks, they simplified various things on it just to make it easier to operate and maintain. Make everything in the um, pack bay, or what they, call it, they called it the engine house then, at least an inch wider um, so that we could get um, access to some of the more um, difficult areas. Don't uh, put your joins and your coolant pipes under the gearbox. Um, because of a leak um, that developed, um, we had to lift the gearbox in order to basically tighten the pipe up. But as with a lot of designers, I think if, if, if they went out and actually lived on a tank for a week and had to maintain it in the field, they may change um, how they did everything. This is a tank museum restoration workshop. We started, we started doing the tool dies fairly early on with the restoration. What did you think about the online fame of your moustache? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> it was all very flattering. It'd be nice if they actually focused on the work rather than uh, my facial furniture. But yes, that's always <laughs> very nice. Um, for a start, I don't actually watch them myself, so, <laughs> but um, I'm slightly amazed as many people watch as do. We're not actors, um, we're not poster boys, um, we were just doing the job that we're here to do and I was very surprised um, at the amount of people that found that interesting. It's gratifying to know that people are interested enough to watch it. Thanks to the Matilda Diaries and the way that that was produced, um, we had an awful lot of key moments in the project that were filmed in some detail. Um, and I think um, we got the balance just right um, from the technical aspect and the interest aspect. Again, it's not just seeing a vehicle run around, actually we're going into the, the various mechanical bits that, you know, talking in depth about, you know, what we're working on, I think has been, you know, a really good aspect of the Matilda Diaries. And actually talking about what this particular piece does, no matter how mundane or, or complex it is. Um, for example, the underneath of the turret that we got one of the volunteers slim to reskin for us, and he did an exceptional job. Um, you know, the public have seen that, and no one will ever see that probably for a, a number of years, but um, at least it's been documented, it's been featured on one of the diaries. You know, the guys doing the job, telling it how it was, um, and it was very encouraging, um, you know, because we could tell how well we were doing and how well we were explaining things by the comments that the people left. We obviously had the encouragement of the thumbs up and the likes, um, which um, keeps you going on those long hours when you could be home eating your tea. Um, because, you know, Matt might want to film something the next day and we need to get it ready. Um, so they, they become an important part of the equation as well because you don't want to let them down either. We kind of um, experimented and got better with it as we went along. Um, and hopefully by the end it wasn't quite so wooden as it may have appeared at the beginning. Um, I, know, I know one thing, all of the guys that appeared in ca on camera uh, felt you know, that they had an opportunity for their work to be recognised and it was nice to put them out front and, and, and let them be seen um, and that can only help. It was a bit of a labour of love and you, I know that you spent nights and weekends and months and months outside of the sort of normal nine to five. How, what, what did your family think about? What was your, um, your life? <laughs> I, I can't speak for the rest of the team, but um, you know I've had to work for months in other countries um, in my previous uh, life in the, in the forces. So um, a couple of hours late in the evening, um, you know, I just meant I had to heat up my own tea, really. I just call me a tank restoration monk. <laughs> no, it's just it's what I've always done. If I get into some pretty like project, and I've just got to plow away at it. You. you I think people that work in museums, by their very nature, are very dedicated to the, whatever it is that's being exhibited. Um, 
You have to be. Um, you know, you might go along at a fair, for example, and see a part on a on a stall, and you'll pick it up and pay your own money for it, and because you know you won't get the chance to get that part again. The clock in the dashboard um, I found on eBay, for example. Um, you know, and it just happened to be the right one. You can't pass those chances up. So, coming in of an evening and doing that extra hour, particularly. Um, because in May 16, when, when I joined the project, we, we had an empty hull. And um, you, you knew, we knew right there and then that we had to put in the, the hard hours if we were going to do it. Um, we're obviously very keen as a department that this sort of project continues in the future. We, and we were very conscious of the fact that that would only happen if we made a success of this one. Did you ever feel at times that you got obsessed by it? Um, <sighs> No more than was required at that time, uh, no. Um, there have been times where it's just been like, oh, let's just get this done. Because it's, you know, how many times we've had that gearbox out and apart and back in again. Um, you know, there's, there's, there have been times where it's been incredibly frustrating. But, you know, you, you forget about that when you see it running around. That, that just goes out the window at the time, yeah. You know, blood pints in that thing, I'm sure Bob and Jonathan have as well. Um, and there's been a lot of blue language, but uh, yeah, you know, it's just just to see it going again is more important than anything. I think the thing that I, I that I miss at the moment, because we're getting other vehicles ready uh, for the summer season, the team is um, split up, um, and we've had to spread our expertise across a variety of platforms. I think um, it'll be nice to get another project where we can assemble that team again and get them to work um, in the same way, um, because. You know, we did an awful lot of growing in that respect, and it would be a shame to lose that. So is it you sort of miss the team working out to it rather than the actual vehicle? Um, yes, to a certain extent. You got it out of me. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you feel any sort of affection for the oh, oh, you're bound to. Um, I'm, I, you know, I've cut myself and bled on it like most of the others. Um, I'm still growing a thumbnail back. To show that, you know, with, with the right sort of attitude and the right dedication it could be done um, and it's put us on the map we already had a world-class archive we had a world-class collection but now I like to think that you know hang on these guys can restore a tank and you know it, a lot of people now when they come here are, are very interested in that aspect well, I'm here with John Glenn, MP, who's one of the junior ministers of Department of Culture, Media and Sport. And uh, one of the issues we have here is looking at funding projects like this. And this has been a great example where we've actually had funding from the Arts Council. And I just wanted to ask you, as a, as a minister that has oversight of uh, the Arts Council, what do you think about projects like this? And what's your thoughts on doing what is military and industrial heritage, as well as all the areas that, of course, you, we obviously think you look after. Well, I think it's a great example of where the Arts Council have had the wisdom and vision to invest in military heritage, which is really important to many, many uh, millions of people up and down the country. And uh, this grant to help with the restoration of uh, this tank, the Matilda II, I think it's a 20,000 grant from the PRISM Fund, is an example of where the Arts Council is relevant across so many of our heritage assets. And that's probably not understood or acknowledged uh, widely. It's not all about um, high-end arts in London. How did the Arts Council, making the point of saying this is significant enough for us to give all this money, how did that, did that have any impact on how you felt about the project? Um, I've got to be honest, um, I, was, I was very surprised that the Arts Council would get involved in a project such as ours. I mean, I think it's to their credit that they did. I'm very pleased they did think it was important enough, and it's good that they're actually backing a British tank, um, which I'm very passionate about. Um, so I was very happy they came on board and gave us the funding. It enables you to go forward a bit quicker than having to fundraise and then do it. Um, for instance, we had to buy a lot of bearings for the wheels, which unfortunately are as expensive as they are, um, and that certainly helped with that, that phase of the project. These things obviously don't occur without the money, without the funding. You know, the, the, these projects are being recognised and they're being, you know, kept going. And this thing wouldn't be where it is now. It wouldn't be going around the arena again. Um, I think when we got a major sponsor on board like that, that gives the um, hierarchy within the museum some encouragement to keep going when perhaps we're spending a lot, uh, you know, money on stuff. Um, so their support played a significant 
part in its success. Um, you don't do anything like this without money and anybody that's prepared to support and give it to us, um, you know, we're, we're very grateful. What, what projects are lined up for the future? Um, well, uh, in the workshop currently, uh, we have a Morris Armour car that's had a complete engine rebuild. Uh, we have a Centurion, which is having a systems uh, maintenance carried out on it, so that involves working on a Meteor. And we're quite excited about that because none of us have done that before, so we want to um, put that engine in with a Meteor specialist and hopefully work with him so that we can get some of the knowledge on that engine. Uh, we have an M16 half track. Uh, now, the clutch is being done on that, but I would really like to get the turret working with the quad 5 O's. Um, so I'm having some discussions with people to see if that could happen. And the Churchill is, um, we're doing a, a maintenance on that to get it back to running order so that we can use it in the coming season. And then that will be part of a display and we will get another one which will do a more lengthy uh, job on uh, to get that back into running order. We also have um, uh, the Beaverette. Um, in the pipeline, which I want to use um, with uh, being led by one of the workshop technicians, but with the majority of the work being carried out by the apprentices under supervision, um, because I think it's a, it's a really good vehicle for them to start off on. It's obviously very important that we pass on all of this knowledge that we're rediscovering to a younger generation, because the museum uh, needs to keep going forward. Um, and we need the skills and the experience here in order that, that we can keep running these vehicles for as long as possible. The apprentices learn um, skills here that they might not learn so easily in other places. We have to hand fit stuff, we have to do an awful lot of fabrication. Uh, the clock I was talking about earlier that I got on eBay, the bracket for that um, was made by one of the apprentices here. Um, just give him a drawing and say off you go um, uh, and he gets to use his hand tools um, it's not CNC'd you know it's all what he's done it's all his work and his mark is on the vehicle now. I'd like to do another restoration project like the Matilda certainly you know I think uh, <clears throat> I think the way that we've gone about this and the way that we've sort of promoted it I think has been really really uh, really important for the museum and I'll certainly learn as much as I have on the Churchill as I have with, you know, with Matilda. You know, yes, the Churchill will be, you know, a good, a good project, but I, I certainly think there are vehicles out there that, you know, we should be really running Crusader. <laughs> what was it like to think that you're doing the same thing that these men would have been doing preparing for war? Um, what we tried to do with this project and with the, this particular vehicle was try to add another element to that historical picture. Um, we added the element that says how did they keep it fighting? Um, what did they do when it broke down? How did they build it? Um, how did they test that something was working all right? So unless you're prepared to run a vehicle, there's a whole section of the history of that vehicle that would be lost. And now we are, you know, I honestly believe we have a much more complete picture of the historical story of that particular tank.